Welcome. I am Dr. David Schmidt, and I will be your tour guide of the stained glass windows in the chapel of St. Timothy and St. Titus on the campus of Concordia Seminary, St. Louis. I was a member of the stained glass windows committee, and Rich Buswell of Lynchburg Stained Glass was the senior artist and designer. Lynchburg Stained Glass created and installed the windows beginning in 2020. The south nave window in the narthex is the Abraham window. Starting at the base, the creation is featured. The spirit in the form of a dove emerges from a swirling of line and color radiating above the waters of creation. Light is a major component of this window area, representing light out of darkness and light from above. You access the rest of the window from the choir loft on the second floor. There, you see how the window design flows up into an area of dark storm clouds. Noah's Ark emerges from the storm area into the light and calm. A dove approaches the Ark with an olive branch to symbolize God's reconciliation with humanity. The images flow upward to Abraham. He is depicted at the moment that the angel stops him from sacrificing his son, Isaac. Isaac is shown, bound and lying on the altar of sacrifice, yet his hands are folded in prayer. Abraham's knife and the torch he would have used for the sacrifice are now cast off. Instead, Abraham is looking up and receiving God's promise that his offspring would be as numerous as the stars in the sky gestured to by the angel. The window design continues as you look down below Isaac. The descendants of Abraham flow from Isaac through Jacob and his 12 sons. There is the Star of David surrounded by 12 stars, each star representing one of the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12th star, unlike the other 11 clear jewels, is a symbolic emerald, a royal symbol of David. The Lion of Judah also appears here to symbolize the tribe of Judah and the line of David. In the North Narthex, the story continues for Christians at the baptismal font, where they are buried with Christ in baptism and raised to newness of life. Mirroring the waters of creation on the South Narthex, the Spirit hovers over the baptismal waters of the new creation. Centered in Christ, figured by the Cairo superimposed on a cross. Here, joined to the death and resurrection of Christ, God's people have new life. The rest of the window can be seen from the balcony on the second floor of the chapel. As Abraham was given a vision of his descendants as numerous as the stars, John is given a vision of the seven angels and the seven churches. While their number of seven represents wholeness, each church is architecturally distinct. This vision captures the unity in diversity among God's people throughout the world as John sees how God's promise that Abraham would be a blessing for all nations is fulfilled in Christ. The second south nave window is the king's window. The window begins in the low left corner with the call of Moses. You see the burning bush with the figure of Moses emerging behind it as he parts the Red Sea. Mount Sinai is depicted featuring the tablets of law. A fiery cloud and lightning swirl around the mountain symbolizing God's holy presence and God's anger with the Jews for worshiping the golden idol. The desert flows out from Moses, reminding us of the wilderness wanderings. When the wandering Jews lost their faith, God had Moses erect the bronze serpent as a path to redemption. A shofar blows out small sparks, recalling the 40 years of wandering. This ram's horn that announced the Jewish New Year separates that wilderness darkness from the bright greens of the promised land flowing with milk and honey. In this promised land appears Ruth, she holds the wheat that she had gleaned, bringing her to the attention of Boaz and thus continuing the line of David. Ruth's gaze leads us to her grandson, King David. There you see the stump of Jesse and a branch that shoots off, intertwining with the figure of David. 
David is enthroned on two tiers, reminding us that he unified the kingdoms of Judah and Israel into one. David's robe transitions from blues to purple to remind us of his common beginnings. He was not born to royalty. He was a shepherd boy. His shepherd's staff transitions into a harp just as his life transitioned from a simple shepherd to becoming the king of Israel. You may notice that David also has an emerald jewel in the clasp of his royal robe. As David plays his harp, reminding us of psalms of praise, he looks upward at the temple of Jerusalem that his son Solomon will eventually build. Here, as elsewhere in the windows, you see angels playing instruments of praise. The third south nave window is the prophet's window. In this window, the story begins at the top with the prophet Isaiah, having his vision of an angel cleansing his lips with a burning coal. Isaiah now prophesies, writing upon a scroll about the coming of the Savior. A second scroll appears. This one features a human heart with an iron pen, the prophet Jeremiah. A third scroll appears, the prophet Ezekiel, who had a vision of the temple rebuilt. From the details of that prophecy arise a turreted gateway and river flowing from the temple of God. As a fourth scroll appears, we see the prophet Daniel. He is engaging in daily prayer for which he was thrown into the lion's den. Here the angel closes the mouth of the lion that was about to devour him. And at the bottom, the scroll of Isaiah again appears forming one of the corner posts of the manger. Words of prophecy become reality. Scripture cradles the Christ. An angel looks over the nativity scene, holding a lily, reminding us of Mary's calm and faithful acceptance of God's plan. Joseph holds a flowering staff with a star of David and an emerald jewel. The line of promised life from Abraham to David to Christ is now complete. An unexpected witness of Elijah figures in the shadows, gesturing toward the future, pointing to the martyr's window which will appear on the other side of the chapel. As in the creation window, the river of life flows down from Ezekiel's scroll to the promised Christ. In the middle north nave window, we have the apostles and martyrs, whose lives give praise to God. At the bottom of the window, we see the martyrdom of John the Baptist, and then St. Peter, who made confession of the faith upon which Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to the church. The waters of new creation are prominent as we see the Ethiopian eunuch asking to be baptized by Philip. Here, the scroll of Isaiah mirrors the prophecy window and links the Ethiopian's baptism to God's suffering servant, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul falls back as he is blinded on the road, while Timothy and Titus look forward to the return of Christ. The figures of Timothy and Titus mirror the original stained glass window in the chancel and remind us both of the namesake of the chapel and of the mission and ministry of Concordia Seminary. In the top of the window, the fires of martyrdom burn brightly. An angel provides a palm branch to an unnamed martyr, assuring us of the victory of God over death, even as we continue to pray for those who are persecuted for the faith today. The third north nave window is called the Feast of All Nations window and foretells of the communion of Christ and his church now and in the life to come. In this window, the artist was capturing the words of the Te Deum. The Holy Church throughout all the world does acknowledge you. How do you see the church throughout the world acknowledging God in this window? At the bottom of the window is a Eucharistic table where disciples from all nations gather. The tree of life emerges from the baptismal waters to form the base of this table. The tree, hearkening back to the stump of Jesse, brings forth wheat and grapes. Around this table gather disciples from all nations. Looking at the disciples, one sees that no barrier of language, age, 
status, or physical ability prevents the faithful from communing with Jesus in this world or the world to come. Above the table, the four evangelists, Matthew the angel, Mark the lion, Luke the ox, and John the eagle, bring the proclamation of the gospel to the ends of the earth. In the center of the earth stands a transparent cross. Tree-like in look, the cross reveals the living grace of God, through which we see the world and reminds us of the presence of Christ in the world yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The river of life continues to flow through this window, calling God's people to celebrate now in hope of the new creation. Such anticipation is seen in the eagle who looks toward the return of Christ and the figures whose robes begin to change to jewel-like tones. Indeed, all who gather around the Eucharistic table participate in a foretaste of the feast to come. The south nave transept features the humiliation crucifixion window. Central to this window is the crucified figure of Christ who is gazing over at the resurrection illustrated in the chancel window. Angels emerge from the background, some holding the victorious palms of martyrdom while others hold the withered grapes of wrath. Unlike the other windows, the angels do not play their instruments. One angel points to Christ and we see the reason why. Christ drinks the cup of wrath. Shards of darkness pierce the window with the sharpness of death, just as the instruments of death have pierced the body of Christ. The sun is eclipsed at his moment of death. At the base of the cross is the ancient symbol of the pelican. Her wing swoops up and integrates with the wings of the angels surrounding the Savior. The mother pelican has willingly pierced her breast to feed her young. If you look carefully, you will notice that her brood is also fed by the blood of Christ. This pelican's nest of woven branches become thorns and ultimately an olive branch. To reveal how Christ's torture, humiliation, and sacrifice reconciles us with his Father. The central chancel window is the resurrection. Central to this window is the resurrected figure of the Savior rising above the altar. The figure of Christ, as in all the windows, is of clear, colorless glass, letting the light of the world shine from above. Below him is the darkness of the tomb where the dark power of death has been broken. Here is another ancient symbol of the resurrection, the pomegranate. You see the pomegranate bursting in the tomb's darkness, the blood-red seeds radiating outward, winding around this image of the thorns of his crucifixion crown, now turning from dormant brown to a renewed spring-like green. Above the left shoulder of Christ is the hand of God the Father, reaching down and raising his Son from the dead. As God the Father now offers the world his risen Son, Christ has his hands open and arms outstretched, inviting all to come to him. Silhouetted by the sunrise, two other ancient symbols now intertwine as the phoenix rises from the ashes and flames to greet the dove of the Holy Spirit, which descends in anticipation of Pentecost. Their flames become one. In the center of the window, the Word is represented by the sword of the Spirit that is held by the sun. The hilt of the sword is of a cruciform shape, like the gilded crosses of the church. But the true beauty of this cross is not its five jewels, but the wounds of the sun. The wound of the Savior's outstretched hand becomes the center jewel in the hilt of the sword that leads to the Spirit proclaiming the saving work of Jesus Christ to the world. To the sides of this window are the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism. On the left is the Eucharistic wheat found among the lilies of the new creation. On the right, the chalice and grapes. The water flows down into a baptismal stream that continues on into other windows, reminding worshipers that they have been baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ. 
Angels, as in other windows, play different golden instruments in exaltation of God the Son. The north transept window is the exaltation, judgment, and the new creation window. Christ returns, his hair flowing back toward the new Jerusalem as he sits in judgment on his throne. He reaches out to the righteous with his wounded hand as he gestures upward to the eternal city from which he has come. The figures of many nations are drawn to his presence, some more recognizable than others, as they represent past, present, and future believers in him. In the upper right of this window are figures and attitudes of distress and despair. They have been judged unworthy and are caught in the place of darkness, unable to continue into the heavenly city, shards of darkness, the sharpness of death, reminiscent of the crucifixion, block their way. Over Christ is a dove whose wings connect the heavenly city to the presence of Christ. Angels trumpet their golden instruments, heralding the new creation and announcing Christ's return. The river of life flows from the new Jerusalem, fulfilling the prophecy of Ezekiel seen in the prophet's window, and comes down through the window to merge with the waters from the chancel window and connect with the river that flows throughout all the windows of the nave. At the very bottom, one sees a glimpse of the new creation.